Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. If you were to look at my inbox every morning, you'd notice about 60 to 70 emails. Then as the day progresses, another 60 to 70 will stream in. And yet, not one of the emails is from someone in the same profession as mine. As you probably know, I'm in the marketing profession. And if you want to put a weird tag on me, you could call me an internet marketer. So. Why don't I have any marketing-based or internet marketing emails in my inbox? It's not like I don't want to learn about marketing. It's not that I don't want to read what others in my field are up to. Instead, it's a lot simpler. The emails depress me sometimes. And I'm using the word depression, but I'm not really depressed. I'm grumbly, upset, maybe even a bit paranoid but not depressed. However, I do feel this wave of frustration that takes my day down a few notches. I don't feel happy and lighthearted. And I figured it wasn't depression after all. It was envy. This is my story about how I deal with envy. And I kind of know that it's your story too. I think there are very few of us that are free of this problem of envy. We look around us and we see people doing things that we aren't doing. We see them earning a lot more and seemingly without that much effort. And then there are those like me who come along and talk about taking three months off. And I know that there are others who are working their tails off and there is this joker that's me who's talking about the luxury of not just a vacation, but three whole months in a year. So how do we do this? How is it that we can have endless amounts of stuff and we still feel envy? How do we deal with such a situation? Because no one I know is free of envy. We're all at some level envious of others, and even more so in our field of endeavor. In today's podcast, I'll tackle three topics. The first one is, is envy good or bad? The second is, how do you cope with envy? And finally, how to stay motivated and happy despite the envy? Oh, and the transcript and any other notes will be at psychotactics.com slash 115. So with that, let's start with the first topic, which is, Is envy good or bad? On the chilly night of December 8, 1980, Mark David Chapman approached John Lennon outside the Dakota Apartments in New York. Chapman opened fire at Lennon with a .38 caliber pistol. He fired five shots. They were in quick succession. The first shot missed Lennon, passing over Lennon's head and hitting a window of the Dakota building. Two of the next bullets struck Lennon in the left side of the back, and the other two penetrated his left shoulder. By 11 p.m. that night, John Lennon was dead. But what was going through Paul McCartney's mind as he heard the news? And here's what Paul said to Esquire magazine 35 years later. When John got shot, aside from the pure horror, the lingering thing was, well, now John's a martyr, a JFK. I started to get frustrated because people started to say, well, he was the Beatles. And me, George and Ringo would go, uh, hang on. It was only a year ago that we were all equalish. Paul McCartney, now Sir Paul McCartney, was horrified. 
and he was envious. Back in the 1500s, Michelangelo di Lodovico Bonarroti Simoni was going through the same pangs of envy. Michelangelo was no ordinary man. He was no ordinary painter. He was unique as the first Western artist whose biography was published while he was alive. In fact, two biographies were published during his lifetime. This is the artist who created the Statue of David, the Pietà, the Last Judgment, the Statue of Moses, and painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. In his lifetime, he was often called Il Divino, the Divine One. And yet, he was openly envious of another older contemporary, Leonardo da Vinci. So is this factor of envy normal, and is it any good or bad? In the August 2015 edition of The New Yorker, Richard Smith, a psychologist at the University of Kentucky, gives us an insight into envy. Smith began studying envy in the 1980s, and he writes that the feeling typically arises from a combination of two factors. The first is relevance. An envied advantage must be meaningful to us personally. A ballerina's beautiful dance is unlikely to cause envy in a lawyer, unless she once had professional dancing aspirations of her own. The second is similarity. An envied person must be comparable to us. Even though we're both writers, I'm unlikely to envy Ernest Hemingway. Aristotle, in describing envy, quotes the saying, Potter against Potter. When we admire someone, we do so from a distance. When we envy someone, we picture ourselves in their place. So, is this factor of envy normal? The closer we get to someone's capability, the less we seem to admire them. Instead, what might pop up is an intense state of envy. I remember being in school and there was this friend of mine whose father traveled by Swiss Air. Back when I was in school, traveling locally by plane was quite the luxury, but a trip overseas was almost out of the question. I remember being upset with the little Swiss Air booklets that my friend brought to school. It wasn't even like this kid was taking those flights, he was just getting these hand-me-downs from the flight itself, and yet there was this factor of envy that swept through me every time I saw those booklets. Envy, it seems, is mostly bad for you. Admiration is good. Envy is, for the most part, complex and bad. Plus, it's painful, which is why my inbox has almost no emails from people who are marketers like me. I do read some emails, but just a few. I put in long days and I enjoy my work tremendously. And yet, it's very hard to watch an email pop in about how someone just achieved some goal that you've been aspiring for for a long time. Make no mistake, at Psychotactics we've been very successful over the years and we've lived a life that seems unimaginable. And yet, the admiration slips away over time and I feel this weight of envy. And it's hard to admit, but eventually if you and I were pumped with the truth serum, you would admit it as well. You, I, we're all envious about others. Some to a large extent, some to a smaller extent. And no matter how fabulously wealthy or well-known we are, no matter how far we've come in our lives, we still have to deal with envy. So how do you deal with envy? Let's find out in this next section. I remember the year 2000. I'd just arrived in Auckland, New Zealand from India. I'd never been to New Zealand before, and now I was planning to spend the rest of my life on these islands in the Pacific. If someone showed up at the airport, took me to their home, got me a phone, rented me a house, well, that would have been beyond my wildest dreams. And that's just what happened. 
In episode number 50 of the Three Month Vacation Podcast, I talk about our move to New Zealand and how fellow cartoonist Wayne Logue, who I'd only met online, did all of the above for me and a whole lot more. To have such a start when moving to a new country was beyond my wildest imagination. But let's say someone else showed up at the airport. That person then said that in fewer than two years from the day I landed, I'd be in marketing. I'd give up cartooning. Then that person would go on to outline how my life would unfold. And going forward 15 years, that I'd have a membership site, I'd have clients, I'd have the ability to go where I wanted, when I wanted. What would I make of such a bizarrely rosy prediction of the future? I think it was wonderful, wouldn't I? To understand just how much I have, I have to use the time machine. I have to get on board and take myself back to Auckland Airport. I go back to that point when I first got to New Zealand, and that kills any kind of envy on the spot. No matter how many waves of envy surge at me, I realize something. I could have never envisioned the life that I have now. And that is true for a lot of us today. Most of us have lost some hair, we have gone round the edges, and possibly we have even a tougher life today. Yet, almost none of us would swap our lives for yesteryear. We can't really stop ourselves from getting envious. We look at the neighbors, they have a new car. We look at our friends and they are posting photos of themselves in Tahiti. And probably worst of all, in the professional sphere, we work really hard and we believe that we work harder and better than most of our peers, which brings in that wave of envy. But the time machine trick really works. You go back in time when you were younger, and for most of us, it represents a time when life was different. And yet, we like the lives that we now lead. We like the gadgets that we use today. Our families have grown around us, and there are thousands of memories that would vanish in a flash if we went back in time. I don't know about you, but this is my trick for envy. I go back in time. I go in my time machine. My time machine has one dial and it's set to the year 2000. Just the thought of going back in time brings back pleasant memories. And yet, today is the world that I want to live in. And so, in a flash, my envy is gone. But I still have one more mountain to climb. I may not be envious, but I need to stay motivated. I need to stay happy. So how do I pull that bunny out of the hat? Let's find out in the third part of this podcast. I don't know if you've ever fed seagulls at the beach. On a sunny day, as you head to the beach with your fish and chips, the seagulls are waiting. As you throw out a chip, there's a mighty scramble. But notice who almost never gets the chip? Yes, it's the so-called leader of the flock. You know the one I'm talking about. This male, and it's most certainly a male, spends his time chasing away all the rest of the seagulls. You throw one chip, you throw another, you throw a third, but the leader never seems to get a chip. So which of the birds gets the chip? The ones that are focused on the chips, not the ones that are focused on each other. And this is the real secret of how to stay motivated. When we look around at each other, we're too focused on the others and not on the chip. And the chip, for the most part, is our work. It's the one thing that brings us the greatest satisfaction in our lives. Whether we run a restaurant, we sell strawberry ice cream, or we write books or whatever we do for a living, it's our work that brings a deep sense of satisfaction. And yet, we make a lot of mistakes along the way. I've made a lot of strategic mistakes in my life. We were on the internet way back in 1997, so I did catch on to the ebook phenomenon, but I missed out on blogs, I missed out on YouTube, I missed out on podcasting. I started a podcast before it was popular and then I gave up in 2009, just at the point when it started to take off. And so, as I looked on, others took my spot, yes, my spot. The way out of that seagull scrap 
is to look at your own work. At first, your work may not seem a lot different from your competition. However, over time, you'll find your own space, your own plum projects. And you'll get yourself a group of people that love your work. The envy won't go away, but you will stay focused on your chip. And that will keep you motivated. And this is the real secret of how to sidestep the envy and to be happy instead. The envy doesn't go away. You'll always be jostling for space in a scrappy flock of seagulls. But you'll know when to get the chip. And then you can fly off with your chip happy as a gull on a sunny day. And that brings us to the end of today's podcast. And we covered three topics. The first one, which is, is envy good or bad for you? And we saw people like Paul McCartney, like Michelangelo, like Leonardo da Vinci. These are very accomplished people and they had envy. And well, it's pretty normal. It's pretty bad for you. That's for sure. How you can cope with envy. That was the second thing that we looked at. And really, you cope with it the way, well, I can't say how you would cope with it, but how I cope with it is I go into the time machine. I go back in time and I compare 2000 with 2016. And I know that 2016 is a much better place. And finally, we looked at the third thing, and that is how to stay motivated and happy. And for this, we have another analogy, which is the seagulls, which are always going to be scrapping around you. Your peers are always going to be around you. They're always going to look better in some way. Maybe they take more breaks. Maybe they make more money. Maybe they do something else. You have to focus on your chip and you'll get your chip. And that's the thing that you need. So what's the one thing that we can do today? To me, the time machine is the best tool of all. It's the best method to counter envy. So I would say the one thing that you can do today, and you can do it right away, is just go back in time. Go back in time and look at the year 2000 or 1999 or 2005, whatever it is you're comparing with. But switch your dial to that time and you'll find that life is indeed better today and that you don't have to be as envious as you are. So what else is happening in Psychotactics land? Well, there is a course, but it's not happening until next year. However, we are going to sell those 25 seats and they go quickly. So those 25 seats are going to be available on the 10th of December. If you're a 5000 BC member, you will have a different date. We'll let you know in the 5000 BC newsletter. But the 10th of December for everybody else, that's the day that we open up the seats and the course is starting on 6th of March. It's about eight weeks. We'll give you more details with the sales page and you'll learn what this first 50 words is all about. But essentially, when you're starting out a podcast, when you're starting up a webinar, when you're speaking, when you're writing an article, anytime you want the audience to listen to you in five seconds, you're going to have to use something. And that something are the first 50 words that come from your mouth or the first 50 words that go on paper. And there are many ways to do this. And this is what we do in the course. This is what you learn. This is what you get proficient at. And most importantly, you don't waste all that time trying to figure out how do I start this article? How do I start this podcast? How do I start all of this stuff? Because you will get your customer's attention immediately. So 10th of December, that's the day when it goes live. The second thing is Queenstown. Is your landing page effective? You're going to learn how to reconstruct your landing page. And we're having this on the 13th, 14th, and 16th of February 2017. So that's in New Zealand. If you want to find out more about that, and the prices are going up at the end of this month by 100%. So check it out. That's psychotactics.com slash x2017. And finally, if you're in Psychotactics or have been on Psychotactics for a while, you've noticed that we increase the prices of most of our products, our services, membership site, etc. 
And clients never leave. So why is this so? The biggest reason is we have benchmarks. So when you finish reading a product or you attend a course at Psychotactics, you don't end up with more information, but you end up with a skill. And so late last night, I was reading email. Well, nine o'clock is late for me. And I shouldn't be checking email at that time, but I flicked it on and I read this post from Simon Lamy. And he said, just got round to reading page 46 of book one of Dartboard Pricing. So he's talking about the pricing book, Dartboard Pricing. So he says, my God, it's amazing. Had to close the PDF briefly and email you to say how brilliant it is. I'd have paid $39 just for the first book alone. So obviously he's talking about the three books at Dartboard Pricing. And if you haven't got Dartboard Pricing, go to psychotactics.com slash TTC. That stands for Trust the Chef. So go to psychotactics.com slash TTC and you'll share in the same enthusiasm as Simon Lamy. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now. Bye-bye. Still listening? In one of the previous episodes, I talked about the timer and how the timer is very, very useful to get things done. Even though you have a deadline, using a timer is incredibly important. So Adam Kraft, who is a 5000 BC member and also a listener of this podcast, he sent in this recording. It's slightly distorted. The sound's not as great, but the message is very strong. So here's Adam Kraft. Using a timer has been surprisingly a very effective tool for me. A little over a year ago, I decided to finally take action on getting myself out of a career path I'd become really frustrated with. And in order to do this, I needed to do two things. I needed to learn new software and then demonstrate a proficiency with it publicly in a way that I could show prospective employers and then get hired. For me, and in this career path, this meant I needed time working with the new software to actually learn it and get around it, and then to do screen capture videos and put them up on YouTube so I could demonstrate to people what I knew. My biggest problem with this, though, was time. I didn't have any. I already had too many projects going at once, and taking more time at night meant taking time away from my wife, and I just wasn't willing to do that. Instead, I decided to wake myself 45 minutes earlier in the day, which effectively gave me a physical timer. As soon as my alarm went off, I had 45 minutes to get to the computer, knock the rust off, and get to work. After that, I had to go get ready for my work day or else I'd be late to work, and which was obviously unacceptable. Every day I was faced with learning something new or solving some problem that I had, and every day if the timer was up, I had to quit cold turkey, I didn't have an option. Miraculously, this turned out to help me. Instead of sitting and being unable to solve problems and getting frustrated, my subconscious literally began solving problems for me. I would be eating dinner with my wife, for example, and a solution to an issue or a problem that I was stuck on would just hit me out of nowhere. The rule was, though, that I couldn't fix it until the morning, which would then make me excited to get up and start working again. The timer in this case prevented me from getting exhausted and frustrated and kept me on track and even excited to start working the next day. In a very short period of time, and I'm talking about like three weeks, I'd gone from knowing the rudiments of the software before I started to being able to teach someone how to use parts of it via video to make professional work. That's all we have from Psychotactics Land. I'll say bye for now. Bye-bye.